All right, now we have a little more logistics before we get to our first keynote speaker. So a little bit on how we'll handle our question and answer sessions. Throughout the workshop, we'll leave five to 10 minutes at the end of each panel for questions and answers. We'll be using the Mentimeter for our Q&As this year. As you are listening to the presentations, please pull up Mentimeter on your phones and enter your questions for speakers there. At the end of each session, the questions will appear on the screen, and I will read the questions or the speakers will choose a question to respond to. Please include the speaker's name in the question if the question is for a specific speaker and not the whole panel or group of speakers. If you're active on social media, please feel free to post throughout the day. The hashtag for the workshop is number sign or hashtag SCW19. And they want me to take a picture of all of you to get us started today. So if all of you could put on your best smiles and maybe give me a nice wave, we'll take a picture out there so that folks can see that we're all here for the Sustainability Communities Workshop today. All right, so please help keep, us, keep the conversation going and help us use social media to spread the word about today's event. Every year our workshop organizers, in, <laughs> organizers incorporate your survey feedback to improve the workshop. Based on previous feedback, we've included speakers from all generations, including youth, and added a third keynote speaker in the afternoon. Please make sure to complete the survey at the end of the workshop day to help guide us for future years. Our keynote speaker this morning is Josh Tickell, presenting Changing the Climate of Our Mind from Despair to Global Action. Josh is an internationally recognized expert on sustainability and the climate, a filmmaker, and author of multiple books on sustainability-related topics including how climate change effects can be reversed by regenerating the world's soils. His most recent work, The Revolution Generation, How Millennials Can Save America and the World Before It's Too Late, provides tools to reshape political power, change the climate conversation, and save Earth's ecosystems. In 1997, Josh captured global attention by crossing the US in his veggie van, powered by French fry oil. A featured guest in print and on television, Josh regularly consults on sustainability, energy, trends and technologies with corporations and governments. Please give a warm welcome to Josh Tickell. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good morning. Oh, awake, ca caffeinated. I love it. So I'm going to talk about something that I don't usually speak about today, which is a state of being and how we move as an environmental community from one state to another. Now I knew there'd be some students in the room, so I made a fancy title. If you're a, you know, Ringling student, a new college student, this is also known as a broad analysis of Homo sapiens 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 responses to external environmental stimuli resulting in meta so you know, you get it. <laughs> so very little of what I'm gonna tell you today is true. Now, that doesn't mean I flew all the way to Florida to lie to you. You'll have plenty of politicians in the next year that'll do that. But, oh, sorry. Did, that, <laughs> did I say that out loud? You know what I mean. I, what I mean is, what we're going to talk about today is not empirically true for the most part. Like, you can't pull a ruler out and measure it. But I assert that what goes on mentally, socially, spiritually, psychologically behind the environmental movement is just as important as your daily work in sustainability. What do I mean by that? Well, something called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is very much like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whatever you look at, whatever you see, the world around you often confirms the basic assumptions that you have about the world, okay? Just let that sink in for a moment. We'll talk about it. Let's talk about despair. Now, there is actually something now called climate despair. It's like a real thing. People are suffering from it. They have psychological treatment for it. Uh, not very effective, but yet it exists. And this has become such a state in our world that people are literally suffering from it. So if you're in a 
field of despair. Your cognitive recognition of the world is given by that despair. And you can see, if you kind of are in a space of desperation, you, uh, you may also be in avoidance, sadness, denial, fear, depression, hopelessness. This is the field, right? So when we address climate, e climatological or ecological issues from a state of despair, it's almost impossible to get a different result. The state of despair will show you that the world is actually falling apart because everything you look at is part of that cycle, right? You look at the news, oh my gosh, here's more confirmation. I was depressed when I woke up. Sure enough, first thing on my Instagram feed, very depressing. The climate is getting worse. Next thing I see on Facebook, the news, the whole conversation, the whole scope of your day is now given by that field of reference. And really, if we look at, you know, where the environmental movement is today, the sustainability movement, the ecological movement, there's a lot of despair. There's a lot of just, we've got to do it. Otherwise, we're all going to drown in about five minutes. The tidal wave's coming, you know. It's really, it's really a state of despair for many people. Oops, let's go back. If we look at where the environmental movement, the modern environmental movement, I'm not talking about Thoreau or Walden, but the modern environmental movement, where did that begin? And if we go back to 1969 in Santa Barbara, the oil spill on the Santa Barbara beach was really a touchstone moment for America and much of the world. You know, President Nixon went to see the oil spill and he walked on the beach in his wing-tipped shoes. And that's when the EPA was created. It was created by a Republican president. But it was inside of a context of anger. And so if we look at the sustainability, if we look at the ecological movement today, you know, we vacillate as a movement, and I'm not saying people in this room, I'm not even saying you particularly, but I'm saying the movement in general largely vacillates between despair and anger, right? And if you're angry, the world looks angry. The brain literally narrows its focus. The cortisol increases in your bloodstream. And what you see is exactly what you feel. An angry world, right? A world where the environment has been misused and the resulting emotion is one of rage or anger. You know, it's the manatee, it's the oysters, it's the watershed, it's what used to be. And the result is where we find ourselves when we really look at those issues, not critically, but emotionally. And so we go to protest. That's kind of the, the next step, the next stage of the environmental movement. And um, I, am I knocking the projector? Somebody else bouncing up and down. I don't know, it's high vibration stuff, guys. <laughs> high vibration stuff this morning in Florida, okay? Um, protest, so you know, where are we as, as a global ecological movement? Where are we as a global movement around sustainability where we're moving now from anger to protest? Protest feels a lot better than anger, and anger feels a lot better than despair. We're moving somewhere, but you know, protest is not necessarily uh, constructive. It feels good. It's, uh, it, it's an exceptional adrenaline rush if you've ever been chained to something and somebody's coming with a chainsaw. It, I'm just saying, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Um, it's exciting. There's excitement in protest and there's camaraderie. So there's a lot of energetic movement in this. And this is what we're seeing around the world. Millions of young people protesting. This is the generation that was predicted to never leave their cell phones, to be so lazy, right? And here they are, millions protesting around the climate. This is a protest uh, that my wife organized. In fact, that's my wife and that's my son. Uh, 
here's our nanny. <laughs> Here we are, we're protesting. You know, we've got a huge issue in our town. They're spraying neurotoxins uh, to kill a little bug that's on some of our trees. So, so we had a protest in, in good old fashioned environmental style. Uh, and if you look at the global movement, that's kind of where a lot of people are at. Well, I'm angry. I was, I was in despair this morning, but this afternoon I'm angry, so this evening I'm going to protest. <laughs> and then we're going to do it again tomorrow. And you can move from one field to another, but you don't see people hopping a lot from like despair immediately to protest. They, it's, it generally goes in stages, right? So where do you go after protest? Where do you go next? Right? Well, some people will go from protest to creation. Right? We need to do something about this. We need to have a meeting. We need to get together in a room with green tables and sit together and talk about how are we going to fix the problem. And maybe we'll have a breakout session later and we'll sit in a circle and everyone will get heard and we'll have a whiteboard and we'll come up with a lot of ideas and we'll have a design and we'll, we'll formulate a plan. And then we'll have a committee. And, and, and that's a context, it's a field. And it's a new place that the environmental movement has been playing. It, you know, ever since the 60s, you move from one field to another, you move back and forth. This morning I was in despair, but then I heard about this cool meeting, and mm, it made me a little angry to hear about the manatee, so I brought my protest sign, but then I decided to be part of a creation session, and now we're gonna do something. And inside the world of creation, you're given by the action of creation. So a lot of the ecological movement is moving into some form of this state, right? We are designing, we're envisioning, we're, we're trying to generate something new, right? Something new, e even the idea of sustainability, I would argue, is a creation. Sustainability was a creation. It got created after the first Earth Day. It was a new idea that we could sustain where we were at as a species. Now, the problem with any of these fields is that the field is limited. It is a self-confirmation. Okay, we came up with the idea of sustainability, and we've been playing inside the realm of sustainability. The issue with that creation is that we're trying to sustain a society. You know, we'd already had 10,000 years of planet destroying humanity. <laughs> and then we wanted to, dis to sustain the destruction. <laughs> so again, these are limited fields. And where do you go from creation? Well, if you're a tech person, you go to action. Now it is time to build the future. We are going to technologically fix the problems that we've created by building something called a Tesla automobile. And you can buy one for $58,000, right? We've created a solution. We're gonna engineer, we're gonna build solar, we're gonna build efficiency, and we're gonna fix this problem. And that is a space. And you can see tech tycoons love to hang out in this space. They literally can't talk about anything that's not in this space. You know, a technocrat is like, well, you know, pff, pff, climate. You know, pff, have you seen this widget? And they'll just unveil something. And, you know, this is going to fix the climate. I, I just need some VC money. And we can do it. And, you know, three to five years, we'll flip the company. We'll be billionaires. We'll hang out on the Cayman Islands. It'll be awesome. Right? That's the space of where we're at in terms of action. It's, and none of these spaces are bad or wrong. And empirically, you could say none of these spaces are true or false. But they are spaces that we as a community, if you're engaged in the environmental conversation, chances are you've, you've gotten to be in at least one or two of these spaces, right? And they're both helpful to see a progression. If you think about the environmental movement, you know, boom, we had this sort of 
awareness that happened. My God, the planet is melting. We're all going to die. I feel a state of despair. I'm angry. There's oil spills. I'm going to protest. I'm going to create new things. We're going to build electric cars. It's kind of a progression. It's a historical progression of where we've been. You know, I've been in the environmental movement since I could walk, literally. I held my first protest sign when I was four or five years old. And I grew up in the environmental movement. I grew up hearing these terms, deep green ecology, and, and you know, looking at environmental justice issues, and how they intersect with social justice issues, and water, and air, and all of it. It's been, it's literally been like, I, that's, I'm a fish in a fishbowl, and that's what I swam around in my whole life. But when you step back and you start to look at the movement, you start to go, wow, we self-limit based on our perception, based on our perception of one another. Like protest is a self-limiting mechanism because it's a fight, right? And in a protest or a fight, there's one objective. When, when you're fighting with somebody, there's an objective, right? What's the objective? Win. To win, to be right. I mean, anybody who's married knows that. Right? So that's what protest is. Protest, it assumes a good and a bad, a right and a wrong. Right? And so we limit the conversation of what's possible based inside the field where we're at as a movement, as a species, as a consciousness, as a people, learning and growing and trying to figure this huge thing out called the planet and how do we live on it. And technocrats are great. I love Tesla cars. It's all great, right? But it doesn't necessarily solve the underlying issues in and of itself. It's a tool. Protest is a tool. I assert that despair is a tool. It's not a terrible thing. It is a natural state. We are Mammals, we're, we're animals. When we see the natural world in uh, a state of duress, as an animal, we go, ooh, that doesn't feel very good, okay? So again, none of these are wrong. And then we get to the point of, well, we created this thing in a group session in Sarasota at 9.15 in the morning, and we had a great idea, and we built it, and then we got the VC money, and we sold it, and, and then ev now everybody's using it. And I don't, it's just, it's gone. It's, it's, it's in society. It's getting integrated, right? And that's both gratifying and kind of sad because there's, you can't fight against it anymore. It's kind of being used. Maybe it doesn't, it's not the right color. You were hoping that electric vehicles would be fuchsia and they turn out to be more like a green thing. You wanted the plug to be like that. And you know, we get caught up in that kind of conversation of like, well, it didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted it to turn out when it got integrated into society. But yet, that is a phase, right? And we start to forget we start to forget the invention, whatever it was, the water-saving device, the manatee thing that helps manatee, you know, oh, we're moving on. We've got other things to do. And before we know it, it's lost. It's just part of society. Al Gore's light bulbs, they didn't work out, but then they had these other light bulbs called LEDs, and now everybody's using them, and they're not very exciting, and solar panels are everywhere, and everybody's trying to get an electric car, whether they have one or not. And, and so there's this this point of like, well, we did all those things and it didn't fix the problem. We made the inventions and they got integrated and they just got lost into the flow of society and yet now I'm back and maybe I've fallen back in despair, right? And the despair might be worse because you've seen the whole cycle at this point and now you're really, really upset that the planetary problems didn't get fixed, right? It's like a real self, you know, this is a, this is a gnarly cycle, okay? And so, lost, and lost things get boring. The, at the end of the change cycle, we're no longer fighting the battle. The protest is over. Everybody's got a light bulb, right? So where do we go next as a global movement? Because, 
We've gotten good at despair. We've gotten good at protest. We've gotten good at inventing cool things. We've gotten good at the fields that we've been through. And we're on a bit of a rinse, lather, repeat cycle. What's next? What's the next phase mentally that we can go to to address these global issues? I'm going to throw out some crazy stuff, okay? This is just a proposal. I'm not saying you have to do it, and I'm not saying it's the solution. Again, I'm not even saying it's true. But in a state of meditation, one finds that the human brain undergoes a metamorphosis. And areas of the brain that are very active on a daily basis shut down. We're not exactly sure what opens up, other than people who meditate have been studied and they're found to have heightened levels of creativity after, they're found to have a lot of different levels of ability that didn't previously exist, which doesn't make a lot of sense if you consider that they haven't taken any drugs or they haven't done any exercises. In fact, people who study meditation actually say that the gray matter in the frontal cortex begins to increase over time just by being quiet. That's amazing. So what would be possible as a movement if a field that is, say, as popular as environmental protests became meditation? Not even environmental, because maybe if you meditate on the environment, maybe you'll get depressed and go back to despair, and that ruins the whole thing. But what would be possible if, instead of that, we just focused on building the gray matter in the front of our brains? I don't know the answer. I'm just posing some questions. Because I've done this for 35, 36 years now. And I'm reaching around the edge of the environmental movement. And I'm looking out to the next layer of what are my kids going to do? And what, how are we going to move the ball forward? Because I think we need new fields, new ways of being, new ways of thinking and interacting with one another. Um, you know, I basically came here to have an excuse to show you a picture of my children. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for, thanks for listening. Uh, these are my kids. That's Jedi. That's Athena. Uh, Jedi's two and a half. Athena's five. But really, you know, um, those of you who have children will probably agree, you know, my children are my greatest teachers. And by that, I don't mean that they teach me patience, because I'm not very patient. I'm still, you know, crabby in the morning and all of those things, you know, that people say, well, I learned this from my kids. I don't learn any of that from my kids. <laughs> what I do learn is I learn by observing them. And what I mean is, where they are my teacher, is I observe them in play and joy. And in that state, there is no worry. You know, my daughter is fully cognizant of the environmental problems we face. She's five. And she'll come to me and she's literally, on a daily basis, Daddy, we've got to save the golden lemur. I'm like, it's in Madagascar. <laughs> I looked it up. It's a 36-hour flight. <laughs> There's not enough iPad movies in the world to get a kid to Madagascar. I mean, I, that's just one. You know, I, I could tell you on and on and on. She's, she's, she's committed. She's committed. She sees what her parents are doing. She's absolutely committed. But for the most part, she's a kid. And this is her field. And this is her brother's field now. It's a field of oneness, simplicity, ease, daydreaming, and tranquility. And we go, oh my god, it's so simple. I mean, their lives, they're just, they just don't know anything. If they knew about the world, they wouldn't feel any of those feelings. And maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's our job to forget some of what we know to be true. Because truth is given by our perception. The truth of the world being in free fall is a confirmation bias that happens from a set of emotional drivers and assumptions that we wake up with. Maybe we could accomplish 
the unaccomplishable, the unimaginable, well beyond the field where we're tracking now, if we could get to this state and stay there for a little while. Not to say, forget it all, get, you know, just burn a ton of gasoline and eat baby whales for breakfast. <laughs> like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying a truly decisive, self-actualized state that mimics this. What would be available for us as a movement, as a community, as people committed to bettering life if we spent just a little more time together in this space? I don't know the answer to that question. But I'll tell you a story about a bottle of wine. This is what happened over a bottle of wine. And I'm not saying you have to drink to have the feeling of joy. Um, for some of us, that may be true. But for, for, for the vast majority of us, it's not actually true, right? It sometimes allows the kinship and friendship and connections that we've really wanted all along. I sat down with Paul Hawken at his house. And how many people know who Paul Hawken is? Great. He's an author. He, he edited a book called Drawdown. And the book is 100 Solutions for Climate Change. I said, Paul, I love your book. You're my buddy. We're making a movie together about this issue. And um, I don't think people can visualize what it is you're talking about. I don't think we have a way to represent the idea of drawing carbon down. And I said, what would it look like if we achieved it? And he started to talk. He used words. He used language. He moved from despair and anger. And he, he touched on the field. He used creation. I said, no. I want to know, like, playfully, like, give me an image that would bring me joy. And so we sat there. And this is why it took a whole bottle, is because <laughs> we had to get to the idea of what drawdown looks like. And this is what it looks like. This is the carbon emissions on planet Earth. I had a movie, but it won't play with this particular projector. Like, it goes up and goes down. But the, the deal is, like, this is, this is where we've been, right, up to now. Right up to all the fields that we've played in as a species up to now, right? And carbon's gone up, and the world's gotten not as good as it used to be environmentally, right? And this is drawdown. This is what it will look like when we do the things that we're about to do. The carbon comes back down and it goes into the ground. And sustainability as a concept is replaced with regeneration. And regeneration is where the world begins to biologically rebuild its ecosystems. And we participate. We're partners in that. We're not bad humans anymore. That context goes away. And there's a new context a context of partnership. And that's what it begins to look like. And, and I know it's a graph. It doesn't show you the future per se. But the only graphs that we've ever seen are hopeless graphs. And this carbon going into the ground and restoring the planet represents a sea change in our cities. It represents a different way that our buildings will be made, a different way that we will interact with the natural world. It represents fresh water, an abundance of food. It represents an excess of the things we need as humanity. And that is almost impossible to hear if you're in despair. It's very hard to hear if you're in anger. It's even hard to hear if you're a tech giant in Silicon Valley. It's really only possible to hear what is possible if we move into some state that is somewhere between meditation and joy and tranquility. Because we have to let go of the idea that it's broken and it will always be broken and that we're here to fix a broken world. I actually don't believe those things. I don't believe that it's broken. I don't believe that we're here to fix a broken world. Those are creations. That's part of the creation phase. So I'm going to share the teaser uh, for the Kiss the Ground movie with you all.
and you're all invited to come watch it at the Ringling School tonight at 6 p.m. I hope you do join us. <laughs> it is a scientific journey, but it's a metaphysical journey too. And the movie moves through the states that we saw today. Uh, and hopefully it gets to meditation and joy. I mean, that's the objective, right? Uh, but I think the trailer's fun, so we'll watch that, and then we'll just do a really quick Q&A, uh, and I'll be on a panel this afternoon as well. So <laughs> let's have a look. Let's hope this works. Here goes. Mm. Yeah. There it is. Looks good. So, on a scale from hunky dory to we are screwed, uh -huh. where do you think we're gonna be in 50 years? I would, I would honestly say we're. F I think that we're. F I think we're gonna be fucked. This is the story of a simple solution: a way to heal our planet and keep our species off the extinction list. The solution is right under our feet. It could just be the one thing that can balance our climate, replenish our fresh water supplies, and feed the world. That's why some people are racing to save our soil. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. These chemicals, which were considered way too dangerous to use before, are now being used at rates that would have been inconceivable 20 years ago. Worldwide, we have lost one third of the Earth's topsoil. We have unleashed through agriculture over the millennia carbon from the land, and it's now up in the atmosphere. It's now part of that legacy load of carbon dioxide. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. The principles of soil health are universal. This is not rocket science. There could be a permanent agriculture that regenerated resources. If you look over here, we have my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallowed. Then you look over at our paddocks. You have a diversity of different plant species. You have insects, you have wildlife, plus the livestock grazing on it. There you have soil. Over on this side, you have dirt. There could be a way to to eat food that heals the planet. The quality of the soil is huge. There's a reciprocation. Not only we feel better, we are healthier, but the earth is healthier. It all comes from the earth, big mama. What are we eating? What kind of farming systems are we supporting? Are we regenerating the earth or are we degenerating? Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant, healthy animal, healthy human, healthy water, healthy climate. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. So what decision are you going to make that will make a positive impact on this beautiful planet? Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I won't give up. And neither should you. Now, I know I'm at time, but to be fair, I did, I did start a little late, right? Yes, absolutely you did. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are going to take questions. Are we going to use the Mentimeter, guys? OK, it's coming up now. <laughs> and so you can just look. Yep. Sure. OK. All right, great. Love your book, Kiss the Ground. When is the film coming out? Soon. <laughs> Kiss the Ground be on YouTube. Uh, there are many. We've done a lot of short films at the Kiss the Ground nonprofit. We have a ton of short films on YouTube, and we're doing a ton more. There's a training course available online, kisstheground.com. I believe somebody here uh, with the Florida House went through the training course. Anyway, you did. Yes. Congratulations. Good, right? Did you learn a lot? Was it life changing? Would you recommend everybody does it? Okay, so you guys do that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, what are three things the average person can do to help? You can compost. You can get involved in uh, the political process. And uh, you can meditate. How to change mindset. Example, this room is too cold. This is wasteful energy. We keep doing what we're used to. Well, OK, you could open the doors and turn off the air conditioner. Um, but it, you know, again, I think that that is perhaps a very poignant question, 
really, how do you go from, how do you pivot from one field to another? It's very hard to go from despair to joy, right? Like if you've ever been in despair, you know, you can't just go to joy. But you can pivot and you can move up that scale, that emotional scale. How do you do that? You focus on a better feeling thing. You move toward the destination. How do you drive to Phoenix, Arizona? You don't just teleport. You have to get in the car and go. And that's an emotional journey. I could talk a lot more on that, but we don't have a lot of time. Hopefully that gives you something to munch on. Are you equating Exxon's interest in sustainable profits with the notion of sustainability? Whoa. <laughs> um, okay, pass. Um, thank you for including youth. I love young people. Does your ideas on soil health consider the issue presented with microplastics in the soils? I mean, we're going to be dealing with plastics for the next couple hundred years. That's definitely a good, a good tech thing, but... Um, uh, it's also a thing that we're seeing mycelium can break down, which is exciting. H how many people have seen the film Fantastic Fungi? I recommend. If you see one film in the next year, see Kiss the Ground. If you see two films, <laughs> see Kiss the Ground and see Fantastic Fungi as well. Um, Indigo, I don't know anything about that. Sorry. Uh, can we scroll down? Um, yes, it's true. People in despair have a have trouble imagining a better alternative. You know, we started Kiss the Ground, we said, uh, this is amazing. Here's a, here's a prime example of like cognitive uh, stagnation and, and confirmation bias. We said, okay, here are the numbers, very simple. A tree, by the time it's 40, can sequester, does anybody know? Does anybody know how much carbon a tree can sequester by the time it's 40? One ton of carbon by the time it's 40. An acre of soil for every 1% organic matter that you add to that acre will sequester 10 tons per year. So we take our soils from where they are today, about 1%, to 14% where they were when Europeans came to the United States, and we have sequestered a significant portion of the CO2 in the atmosphere. That's what we said, you know, seven years ago when we started working on Kiss the Ground, and no one could hear it. There literally was not enough like field for that conversation to exist into. So that's the exact, like what don't we know? What, what is the next level of the solution? It, it, we can't even hear it. I assert we can't even hear, like we haven't gotten to the emotional meta space to actually listen into what's possible. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm saying what's available on the other side may be much bigger than we can imagine right now. I think that's a good place to end, right? Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll be on a panel this afternoon, right? What time's the panel? Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, she doesn't know. <laughs> it's, it's this afternoon. It's on your, it's on your schedule. Yeah, thank you all. I don't think, there we go. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, and if you didn't get a chance to ask Josh your question, remember that all three of our keynote speakers today will, including Josh, will come together for a 15 minute Q&A at the end of the day. So stick around. And if you have a specific question uh, that you would like answered after the workshop, write it down and leave it at the registration table. There are some note cards at the, the front table for that purpose. Um, and if you have any other questions, please also see Sarasota County staff who planned and organized the event today. So Sarah Kane, where's Sarah? Oh, she just walked in the back door there, so she's waving. And Sophia Mon Mondos, is Ma Sophia here? All right, raise your hand, let them see you. Okay, they also would like, if you were a member of the volunteer or planning committee for this event, could you please stand up right now so we can recognize you if you helped plan the workshop. Okay, He's got a, someone up top there that you can't see. So thank you all to all of the volunteers uh, that put in their time and energy to plan this event for us today. We appreciate your work.